Hey guys, welcome back. Thank you so much for all of you longtime subscribers. For those of you guys that are new to the channel, I'm Dustin, this is Revere Glass, and today we're gonna to be making a vial. Make sure you like, subscribe, and turn on those notifications. In the comments, talk to me about passion. What are you passionate about? Tell me what you love about glass blowing. So, but before we get started in the vial, I wanna talk about some exciting things that are happening. On the online school, we've added a bunch of new features. So now we have courses which are self-paced courses that you can do on your own time. We have an electroforming course that Dan Shelton just came by and did. It's an amazing course. It's very in-depth. In fact, it's the most in-depth electroforming class that we could find online anywhere. So please check that out. Membership is free for you guys for seven days if you wanna check it out. Just go to revereglass.com, go to the courses, and check out that electroforming course. We've also added some other new features, which is great. I remember when I got into glass blowing, I didn't know which tool was right for me, which torch was right for me. And so I've started to create a buyer's guide for torches and tools. That's also on the website and that's free for anybody. You don't have to be subscribed to the website. You don't have to be paying monthly. You can just go to the website, log in and check out these torch review videos. I talk about different torches from Bethlehem, Carlisle, GTT. There's a lot of different choices out there and hopefully for those of you guys starting off, this will give you some information about what are some of the features of the torches and characteristics that you think that you'll be using in your work. We're gonna be adding some new tools, colors and other things onto this buyer's guide. So please keep checking back in to see what we've updated recently. The other new course that we're gonna be doing is Pipe Making One. In the Pipe One class, I'm gonna be releasing one video per week on the online school starting on June 8th. And each week we'll go over it together live on the website from how to make a one -E all the way up to how to make a mini tube with a bunch of shapes in between. There'll be 10 classes long and we're gonna be able to do them together. You can post your work on the website. Go ahead and check that out, revereglass.com. And that course is going to be starting on June 8th. I hope to see you there and work with you so that I can help you on your journey with glass. Workshops. Let's talk about workshops, you guys. We just had a great workshop with Glass by Ginge and Lazy Glass came to hang out and assist a little bit. It was so cool to have these guys in the studio watching them work and seeing how our different styles work together when we made this collab. It's really, really special. These guys were great guests and I would totally have them back anytime. If you'd like to see more of the carving work and improve your skills with carving, go ahead to revereglass.com and check out the replay of the Glass by Ginge workshop. The next workshop is gonna be with Strawberry Glass. That's gonna be eight hours long and there's going to be six camera angles so you can always see the best view you don't have to pay money for a flight and the sound and audio quality is excellent plus you can comment and interact directly with the teacher so for a fraction of the price of going to a live workshop you can check out online workshops and the next one coming up is strawberry glass and i can't wait to have them in the studio the date for that class is may 21st 10 a.m pacific time all right you guys i get a lot of questions about my shirts and where i get them and What's the deal? So this is the deal, I designed them. And the reason why I designed them was because I couldn't find any shirts and styles that I liked for somebody my size. I'm about six, four and 300 pounds. So it's hard to find things that are bright and floral for somebody my size. So during some of my travels, I worked with manufacturers to make my design. And you guys always ask me where you can get them. I just made them for myself. So I'm gonna release four of these designs. This will happen sometime in June. There's a limited quantity for each size, a very limited quantity. This is the first just kind of test run to see. I'll let you know the details, but make sure you follow Instagram Revere Glass and I'll definitely be giving a heads up for the launch then. I wanted to thank our sponsor, Mountain Glass Arts. I had the honor of going to Mountain Glass Arts last month with Kenzo and we got to hang out with Joe, which was an amazing experience. I loved Asheville and I loved the food and the culture and it was just so welcoming. While I was there, I filmed a buyer's guide for torches that's free for you guys. Just if you have any questions about torches or the different styles, you can check that out. But there's so much there. It's such a big space and the people were so friendly. It was really great to see them in person. So I wanna thank them Mountain Glass for your continued support. We all as a community really deeply appreciate you helping make these videos happen. All right, you guys, enough of that. Let's get in the studio with Lazy Glass and Glass by Ginge. Make this vial. Happy bicycle day, everybody. All right, we'll see you soon. All right, so like I said in the intro, I was super excited to have um, Lazy Glass and Glass by Ginge here in the studio. Um, Glass by Ginge taught a workshop, which was amazing. And then after the workshop, 
Uh, we hung out for a few days and made a few pieces. This is one of them. It was bicycle day on that day. And uh, so we decided to make a vial for any sort of liquids or tinctures. So welcome, you guys. Thank you so much for coming. And thank you for doing the On the Torch video for everybody. Well, thanks for having us, Dustin. Uh, it was amazing to get to meet you and to get out there and make this piece with you. And uh, and yeah, here's I'm, I'm glass by Ginge, by the way. Here's Preston. Yeah, we were truly honored. Uh, it was an amazing experience. And we had a great time. Cool. Yeah. Um, it was fun to make this on bicycle day too, you guys, that was kind of fun in the studio and, uh, Oh yeah. I was, uh, kind of unfamiliar with the holiday. And once, once you educated on us, this <laughs> seemed like the perfect collaboration, right? you know, given the, uh, given the holidays. So yeah, for this th turned out very <laughs> serendipitous. Yeah, it was fun. It was, it was, it was cool. For those of you guys that don't know, bicycle day is April 19th and, um, it's a celebration of uh, the anniversary of Albert Hoffman intentionally taking LSD for the first time. And Albert Hoffman is the scientist who synthesized LSD for the first time. So this was the first intentional use of LSD. Um, so we made a vial and we used some, you know, old Italian techniques some sculpture and some carving. It came out really good. You guys, it's on our Instagrams if you want to check it out. Um, but yeah, why don't you guys talk about maybe where how you started with glass blowing and maybe what what why you kept doing it what what got you drawn in you know let, let me know how that worked how did that work for you guys okay so um i again i'm glass by ginge i started back in uh, 2013 um in atlanta georgia i learned from um a friend of mine named doug w glass is his instagram and uh, we went to high school together. I was always interested in it, you know, coming over to his house after after school and checking out the glass blowing studio, always being enamored by it, just like mesmerized and just, you know, staring into the flame, wondering like, how the heck is this even possible? And then, you know, one day uh, he decided, you know, to take up the, his offer and go for it. And I've just been, uh, just been doing it ever since, you know, and, uh, I don't know. It was one of those things where after picking it up for the first time, it just kind of stuck forever. You know, I always knew it would, it would remain a part of my life. So Preston, what about you? <laughs> yeah. Um, actually the first time I blew glass was after a, uh, poker game. I was one of the first people out and some of my buddies that were also out with me, uh, we were just sitting around messing with it. And, uh, I kind of got inspired to, pick up my own equipment and just kind of took off from there um yeah i've just always been drawn to it it's a really challenging art form uh but it's something i feel like i can express myself through as well cool yeah yeah well you guys are both super talented so it was it was really nice to have you in the studio i felt like the synergy was a lot of fun and um our different styles i feel like came together really nicely uh oh, yeah. in, this, in these in this piece we have another one too that we're working on but this one it's like kind of the similar theme yeah, I think the the blending of styles was perfect with the sculpture from Preston, your beautiful line work, and then the cold working on my end. It just, yeah. it's just, and you know, and again, the given with the holiday, it, it all just seemed like the perfect. Because I remember we were thinking, you know, well, what should we make? What should we make? And um, I think once once you said bicycle day, this kind of just this spoke to us. Yeah, uh, yeah. Huh, no pun intended. That's, that's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they spoke to us. Maybe. Yeah, I thought it was pretty funny. <laughs> he, was, he was waiting for that one. <laughs> I swear that was unintentional. <laughs> so that's Glass by Ginger, you guys, in case you want to know who's who in the video. Glass by Ginger over there. Yep. And yep. Um, <laughs> wearing my uh, beautiful Revere um, shirt. Yeah. So for those of you guys, Free release, baby. <laughs> Thanks. So there's the first official announcement. You guys, Glass by Gin, let you uh, let you have it. So I know you guys have asked a lot about my shirts, and um, you know I've said several times that I designed them for myself because that I could never find uh, shirts that I liked in my size. You know, I'm you, I'm a pretty big guy. You know, I'm like almost six four, three hundred pounds, and uh, they don't make these shirts that I you know that are colorful and bright. So I made some. I've got a bunch of designs and I've been wearing them for a long time. 
and I made my first run for you guys. They're super limited. Um, there's only a couple of each size available, and uh, I think we're going to have that launch right around uh, last last part of May, first part of June. I'll give you guys um, some updates on that uh, as I know when we're able to launch them. But there's four designs, and um, Lazy Glass and Glass by Ging each have one on. So, Oh, yeah. yeah. You guys are going to want to check these things out. He had some awesome designs. And the moment we saw him, we were like, man, we got to have these. And so it was an honor for him to to hook it up and... You know, they were they are also perfect for the weather. You know, just a nice little long sleeve over over top the shirt. It was it was perfect. Yeah, I still got mine. I I'm, I might be wearing it right now for all you know. <laughs> <laughs> yep, I definitely wear mine. <laughs> it was it was a bit of a lab coat for me, but I think it was appropriate for the uh, the aesthetic of the Berkeley Oasis. <laughs> yeah, those first prototypes were definitely big sizes, so that's why we just want to refine it before. You know, I get them out to you guys. I want to make sure that it's it's a good. Oh, it was still nice. Though. I enjoyed product. it. It was it was like having like a uh, like a shaw. I don't know how to explain it. <laughs> <laughs> the shaman came to the studio. <laughs> <laughs> it was awesome. So, for those of you guys that are more curious about the Raticello and the technique, um, there's several other videos that I've made that go in depth in how to make a Raticello on YouTube. Um, several different methodologies, and of course, there's the online school, which has a bunch of content that's way slowed down. So you can see each of the steps and uh, really get that in there. But the main focus here is that I'm twisting one, one direction and one, the other direction. And I insert those tubes into each other. And then I use the Nikwala, which is, um, it's a device that a friend of mine invented, Mike Peterson, and it's used for spinning the glass and holding it in different angles. It's it's a pretty cool tool. It's not a lathe and it's not a roller. It's a totally unique item and uh, it's a lot of fun. For it's, sure. It was amazing getting to see one of those in person. You know, I've seen videos for a, a long time. And when I walked in the studio, I remember me and Preston both were like, oh my goodness. Like, it was just amazing to get to see one of those and, and mess around with it in person. They are truly a, it's a, it's a work of art in machinery, you know? Yeah, it is. He, and he's super nice too. And you guys, um, you get a 5% discount if you mention that you heard it from uh, Revere Glass, which is huge. Um, oh, yeah. And on these things. And so, um, yeah, tell him that you heard about it with Revere Glass. He's a super nice guy. And he makes them all himself, man. He's a like computer scientist, um, engineer, coding, robotics. He's got an intense background. You can't beat that. Quality handmade. And he's, he's super enthusiastic about his work. He's really involved with the community and getting feedback and letting people try the work out before he, you know, uh, starts selling it for high prices. So this is a, a section of blue caramel and it's a really interesting color. And maybe, uh, you can talk about it a little bit, um, because it's obviously one of your main colors in your palette because of the work that you do. And maybe you can, if you don't know, or, or you want to talk about the chemistry, but I think, you know, as much information as you, you have about the color, I think it would be interesting for people to know this is a pretty special color. Yeah. So, um, I believe it's, it's like a dark cobalt or something. It's a very dark blue with a lot of silver in it. So when you're initially, when you buy it and you initially look at it, it especially without a lot of light, it almost looks like a black rod, but as you work it and, uh, it fumes on top, you get that tan color that you see him working here and um it's a very thin layer so it's perfect for cold working a lot of people also use it for um doing their um their sandblasting because yep. it's you have to just take off a very fine layer of that top to reveal the dark color underneath and so i generally um do uh lines on top of uh, 38 by 4 millimeter clear tubing so that I still have that raw color on the outside, but I'm mm -hmm. able to get a little bit more out of it by putting it over clear. And then I pull it down to those smaller sections as you see here. So one interesting, uh, couple interesting facts about this color, um, and the way that it's being used here is that, um, this was originally really, um, it was a it was a glassblower signature style, and as far as I know, he was the first one to come up with this, at least mass produce this idea. 
um, Marvel Slinger is quite well known, and he right, made the yeah. movie Degenerate Art. This was one of his, I believe, I think that he's credited with with this concept of using oh. that thin layer of silver over the blue, um, you know, by taking away the material, whether it's with the Dremel or a sandblaster. Oh yeah, that would make so much sense, especially with his classic, uh, that that salt girl or whatever. Yeah, uh, yeah, that with the sandblasted, it's. I mean, yeah, it, I've seen it so often, and then the day once I realized what it was, and you know, it, it just, it, it was a game changer, you know, just to realize, oh my gosh, this one color is so versatile for so many different cold working applications, and yeah, the I, I've always wanted to see people also mix the like the etching with the sandblasting because you know you can get just many different varieties of art out of both different styles so i don't know hopefully people will take this you know color and do a lot of stuff with it because i think it's it's widely abundant and it's just very versatile yeah if you guys do make something using these techniques make sure you tag us on instagram or wherever you're posting it because we'd love to check it out yeah, and, let, us, um, let us see it. We want to see it. And if you have any questions, feel free to, to let me know. Yeah, reach out. Reach out to us and Glass by Ginger, Lazy Glass, and let them know you saw the video. And, uh, you know, these guys are all really nice and helpful. So um, I'm pretty nice. I don't know about Preston here. Uh, I can't speak for him. <laughs> don't bother messaging, right? <laughs> <laughs> so their Instagrams, uh, just we'll, we'll put it in the comments too and maybe on the screen for you guys. But glass by ginge g-i-n-g and lazy underscore glass um so yeah hit those guys up and of course mine is at revere glass all right so we have in lip wraps and we have that new caramelline color um and i also want to make sure to keep this vial pretty small it's already getting pretty big for the size that i wanted to make it so i'm going to take off that excess uh caramelline there can save it for something later because that's a pretty nice new color from North Star. They came in uh, slugger bars. If you guys want to check those out, we got some other videos. Pyro and I use this color as well. Um, super. I've been recommending color. your uh, slugger bar video to uh, a few buddies out here that we were talking about yeah, it with the other day. It's a great, it's a great video, especially with these slugger bars becoming the new norm with a lot yeah. of North Star colors. Learning how to work it is. A whole thing on itself so yep. definitely check out uh, Dustin's video on that yeah I like I like them coming in that way personally for the work that I do and it's also really good for storage so I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm really happy with that and the colors just look great too I mean look at look at that yeah that so that is um caramelline that I sleeved so I put clear over the caramelline and vacuumed it just like I did the radicello and that way I thinned it out a little bit. And that's something that press, um, that's something that led glass did a couple of times in the video and also pyro. So, um, it's, it's a pretty common technique these days to be sleeving your color like that and kind of getting more translucent and transparent tones, uh, from the, from the original dense color. It's, it's pretty dense and you guys can break it down and definitely make it go far. So I'm using the Marver here and just uh, going around, making sure the sides are nice and even and that um, it's ready for the next step, which is going to be attaching the threads. All right. And here we have lazy glass going in on the cherry blossom tree. Is, it, is that, do we decide that was um, walnut. chocolate cran walnut? Yeah, I, I believe think, it was walnut. I think it's walnut. Uh, once we got it in the light, in the sunlight, you could see like a almost like a stain, walnut stain kind of effect to it. Yeah, that that uh, chocolate crown doesn't have. Yeah. And so again, I was gonna say Preston wearing his awesome Revere shirt. <laughs> there it is. One another one, you guys. I'm actually kind of jealous he got that design. That was I, that I really was the one I like, wanted. Yeah, yeah. I, <laughs> I want that one. If you guys, you know, if you want, I'll hook it up, and you guys can be twinsies. <laughs> hey, you ain't gotta tell no, me. No, do twice. not send him the same shirt. <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna do yeah, it. He doesn't, he doesn't want, want that. Do have not do that. <laughs> I'll have to send that one back and for trade in if you do. <laughs> <No>. uh <-huh. laughs> well, that's a really cool tool. It looks like everybody probably has one in their shop, wouldn't you say, Preston? 
Are you talking about the tweezers? Yeah, <laughs> I'm talking about those tweezers. I mean, oh, it's like an man, amazing dude, tool. I, you got a story for us about this? Tool? I know. I need. I need to. Uh, I need to hit up the factory in China that's making them and try and get some royalties on all the. Uh, <laughs> All the, the endorsing I've been doing, but yeah, no, I, I really swear by those t tweezers and, uh, they're just a nice, easy tool to maneuver around. It's nothing bulky in your hand. Uh, I also use a pocket knife, but for small things like fine sculpting, uh, that, or like a scalpel tool are the two preferred, uh, things, but I, I, you know, I can, I can use the edge of that similar to a scalpeling tool. So I just kind of go with those. Yeah, they're pretty cool. I mean, I do you know uh, are they on Amazon or anything? Um, I I'm, I think you they're called like flat paddle tweezers or something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, I get them from Flame Tree Glass in uh, Roswell, Georgia. Uh -huh. I know they have them on their website, or at least they have in the past. That's where I've always gotten them. Um, but yeah, even if you call Flame Tree Glass, uh, there's a lady Maureen there. She could probably point in the right direction if you wanted to use those exact tweezers. Cool. I highly recommend them. <laughs> Yeah, thanks. Thanks for sharing that. I know you, you brought them with you from home, so I knew that must be important. <laughs> it was the only tool I brought. <laughs> <laughs> Lazy Glass will make some really tiny stuff. This is this is on the large side of the stuff that I saw him make in my studio. Correct. So and and keep in mind too that uh he's gonna be coming back out here to do a class where he's gonna work with you guys on making tiny stuff and utilizing your flame. So that, that should be happening maybe in the winter or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, of course. So do you ever look at a picture of what you're sculpting or do you just always work from your head? Um, I, with the, with the, uh, Japanese cherry blossoms, I looked at a bunch of different pictures of just different close up renderings of just a flower. And then also backed out renderings of just the the branch and i also realized there were like dozens of different species yep so um that was a bit of a challenge with like picking one species and going with it so i just kind of i went with what was in my head after spending a lot of time just looking through pictures um yeah did you did you take any inspiration from the cherry blossom tree here um i didn't even notice it <laughs> <laughs> oh no he doesn't have the best eyesight <laughs> oh man i was there was so much to take in man it was <laughs> uh, it, so it's in the front yard and um it's actually it's not blooming it only blooms once a year in february right and so right now it's just green so it's hard to tell that it's a cherry blossom uh, right um but yeah it, in the in the, the february it's just explodes with color and these pinks and whites and it's uh it's pretty pretty beautiful actually you know what inspired the entire entire idea was your son's tattoo when he was showing me uh, when shy was showing me his, his you know japanese almost like pond temple scene kind of thing i'm not sure exactly what he called it yeah i think it's like a bathhouse like a japanese bathhouse. yeah it was it was just so cool and and uh and when we were sitting there discussing ideas that would be you know fitting for all of our styles yeah. and everything. That was one of the first things that popped in my mind. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Shiloh, you guys, if you want to follow him on uh, Spotify, all platforms, it's young shy, um, spelled like it sounds. And he's, he's, he's making <laughs> yeah. music hyper pop. I don't know what he calls it. I, I actually listened through all of his, uh, his entire profile or portfolio the other day while I was blowing glass. Did you really? What'd you think? Yeah, I did. I like it. Um, it's, it's not my particular, music that i listen to all the time but i have listened to other artists that are kind of in that similar genre so i i enjoy it it's definitely well produced yeah um, it's good quality it's like it reminds me of like the sad um it's a like little grunt, you know, like nirvana of my generation you know like yeah. kind of angry and sad and and yeah. angsty <laughs> and, and you know there's nothing wrong with like the little teenage angst yeah I, uh, right <laughs> it's hella good though it's like i think he gets inspiration from like little peep i don't know i don't know the genre so i don't want to sound oh like that and juice world it's juice world. kind of it related yep. it to juice world which i yep. i enjoyed juice world's music and i thought it was very similar so i enjoyed it cool well you guys check them out if you have time look at that cherry blossom thing just coming together really fast pretty cool so yeah i just dot i dot the um the the branches up i kind of leave little nubs of the walnut color where i want to attach a blossom and then I just go in and, uh, you know, attach little beads of, of the pink and I make some bigger, some smaller, um, just kind of going with the flow. I don't really 
plan it out too much. I just try and let it kind of happen. And then uh, the bigger ones, I spend a little more time sculpting and the smaller ones, I spend a little less time sculpting just because it's, you know, giving a little bit of, um, you know, like growth showing that each, each flower is a different stage. And this, where I'm kind of tapping it in the flame and going back and forth, um, that's something I wasn't entirely sure as I was learning if that was something I really should do, but it just kind of felt natural as I would was learning to sculpt. It was like, I'm just gonna heat, barely heat and then sculpt mm -hmm. and barely heat and just one little mean, a millimeter at a time. Mm -hmm. um, but I've started seeing other artists that do that similar technique. So I don't think there's any exactly correct way to do it as long as you get quality results. Yeah, I think that's one of the cool things that's unique to American style pipe making is that this is a fairly new medium. I mean, there's been scientific glass and there's been some sculptors using borosilicate glass, but we have to remember that the color palette really only started to exist in the late 90s. I mean, when I started, there was four colors. There was these sculptures weren't weren't and no one was doing anything like these sculptures back when I started. And all of this is new and everyone kind of came up with their own techniques and developed them because so many people have private little studios at their home or in their garage. And so there's so many different facets and different techniques. Uh, and that's one thing that we like to show here on the torch is that there's many paths to the same thing. And you have to know your body, your studio, you know, all of these factors go into maybe your choice on how you might choose to do something. Correct. And, uh, and then also the tools that you have available. If you don't have the tweezers, <laughs> then, um, then, you know, you might be using a different method, maybe with a hand torch and, and the corner of your marver, you know, there's just all kinds of ways that it, uh, if it's quick and it, and it gives you good quality results, then it's not wrong. So when you're using a cadmium color, did you just switch colors? Are you using? Yeah, I think color uh, I'm adding the. Well, okay, so I added these the uh, yellow. Yeah, so I'm going back and forth. I'm adding yellow dots to the um, center of the flower, and then I'm capping those yellow dots with pink. And what that's allowing me to do is it's allowing me to melt that yellow in, and it's almost like the uh, the pink is 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 a, almost like a shield for that yellow. And so instead of bubbling that yellow immediately when the flame hits it, I'm, you know, dotting it on there, adding a cap of pink and then hitting it and melting it all in. And it's just a lot more friendly to the yellow and keeps it from bubbling it white. And, and then I, after I melt them into like a, a singular bead, I go in with a tiny flame and pull that back out to create that uh, stamen, I think is the pro proper term. Yeah, that's pretty cool because that's a, a hard color to work with, the, like the way that you're doing it with putting the little dots of a cadmium color, especially that yellow. Yeah. It tends to boil, and that's a pretty cool trick to put something to protect it over the top like that. Yeah, it's it's something um, I don't always have the luxury of doing, and so in the case that I don't have that luxury, um, I'll usually take the hand torch and try and melt those in because I can kind of um, wash the... Uh, color into the the you know i can melt that uh yellow in with like a real slow wash with the hand torch instead of uh like an abrasive flame from the actual torch you know does that make sense yeah yeah i just it's i've had a hard time doing that with what you're doing here with the yellow on it's, flowers it's tricky it is tricky yeah i've spent a lot of time messing it up and sometimes you know there, there will be times in here where i do mess it up and I've got to completely rip off the the you know trashy little white bubble that I just made with with the yellow cadmium, and start over. Um, but yeah, you just kind of find that edge of the flame. I always keep it in the very feathering tip of the the flame, and uh, try and just meet that ex precise heat. You don't want to heat it up too hot, but you got to get it hot enough to melt into the color. Nice. How how much time do you think you spent to make the tree? Um, that one branch probably took about an hour and a half, maybe mm -hmm. somewhere around there. Do you have a Bunsen burner at your house? Yeah. Yeah. I use a Bunsen. I wasn't particularly sure how to use a, a an annealing flame on that yeah. Herbie. <laughs> um, but I do have a Bunsen that set up next to my, uh, Bethlehem. So we're just flattening the bottom here and then, um, 
we I actually ended up lining it up with the table so that the tree adds a little bit more support for the vial. Oh, right. I saw that. Yeah. You don't want to knock it over. All right. So what you have, what color pink is this? Is this the, um, I believe we're using pink Cadillac for the, uh, for the cherry blossoms. Yeah. That's a nice color. Yeah. It's definitely, um, it's a go-to for pretty much every pink I use, maybe telemagenta and, and, uh, you know, other pinks for certain applications, but I use pink Cadillac probably the most. Yeah. And that's right a- now um, I'm, I'm essentially walking the air out of it. Um, there are more precise ways to do it, but I like to, you know, work in small sections and walk the air out and uh, eliminate <clears throat> any bubbles or like scuzzing that's going to potentially happen if I don't get that air out of it. So that idea, that concept, um, is credited to Sue Ellen Fowler and she's a wonderful old school glass blower. And, uh, she was one of the primary reasons why we have borosilicate color today. She worked with the original team to come up with the first few colors. And when she taught back at wow. Revere glass in like, I don't know, 2007 or eight or something like that, she had a technique where she was working cat. This was like when the cadmium colors first came out. And she was also making her own colors right there on the torch, um, which is really interesting to see from powders and, and, and mixing things around. And she came up with this terminology called fowlerizing, which is basically getting the air out of the glass so that it's ready to work. Just wow, a little tidbit of history for, for you guys watching. And for us. Yeah, I didn't. I've, I've, <laughs> I've, I've been taught how to do that, but I, I was unaware of the origin of it. I mean, I, I think it's important to, you know, to let people know who are maybe new to this industry so that things don't get forgotten. That's such an easy thing to get forgotten. And, uh, and it's, it's obviously an important technique and there wasn't anybody blowing glass or doing anything at the time. And so these pioneers that, that were all standing on their shoulders, I mean, they deserve some credit, you know? So just pulling the end off here to bring that to a point and clean it up a little bit just to have a plate you know a, an end point to be able to attach because i'm going to attach all those around uh previously to the pedal making i was making a um a, a center point a base i guess for all the pedals and then now i'm just making all the pedals i don't really shape the pedals until i've gotten it on the actual uh i've gotten every pedal set and melted in well then i'm actually going to go in and shape the pedals yeah, so now you're just building those on, onto the flower, connecting each and, one. And if you're having trouble getting these welded on here, you can bridge from from pedal to pedal at the top. You just take some clear and you know uh, tack the end of each one together. Um, you know, if you're really diligent and and careful with it, you can get them pretty nicely welded on there. At, you know, without having to bridge. But bridging is, of course, the more fail safe way to go yeah that's that's definitely uh it would be helpful for having so many things like this that are attached to a very small area and yeah and melting in each connection to its fullest yes and and what i'll end up doing here is like i'll actually go back and i'll kind of almost like like you're flaring a foot or something i'll hit the whole base on on the inside and the back side and all the bases of the pedals and I'll just kind of spin and keep them from touching each other. Mm -hmm. Um, But I do kind of at some point go back in and melt them all in with just like, you know, uh, a kind of a washing flame. Yeah, that's cool. That's a good idea. And I bet with the centrifugal force, you can get it to not touch itself. Correct. You just have to be careful with that, but yeah, you can get it. And, And I like, I like the idea of letting gravity and the flame, uh, bring the glass to rest instead of forcing it to rest because I mm-hmm. feel like that's a less stress stressful way to to do it if that makes sense. This is another pretty tricky thing here. I do bridge these. Yeah, that's still pretty tricky. Like, yeah, I mean, think? I basically I basically try and get them both as hot as I can before I tack them, and then you see I'm mm-hmm. just bridging on to the end. Yeah, that's smart really hard you guys because you have to get in there with the mini torch and make your flame super small and 
uh, he's bridging that because th that thing is just going to get hot and floppy unless it's bridged. So uh, definitely a good good to see bridges being used this small. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's pretty cool. Um, even with my turret pro, sometimes I, I'll bridge things just just to keep an end point in place. You're really just focusing on that end point, staying where it needs to be, and then you know melting the rest in. So now we're just removing the bridges. Um, I believe, yeah, taking the bridges off. Oh, no. Yeah. So they're cold sealed onto the end yeah. there. Sometimes you'll get them sealed a little bit, you know, you know, a little bit more than you want to. But most of the time you can just hit it, shock it with a little heat and then it'll snap right off. And now again, to protect the the yellow and, from boiling. Yep. And it also adds a little flair to the flower as well. Yeah, I was I was contemplating what color I wanted it to to go with on on the ends of those, and I thought just to not have too much color going on, it would be better just to keep it pink. I like to keep my color ways a little more simplified than you know. I don't always go for realism, I guess. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So now just fixing it up and getting it ready to attach to the vial. You guys can see the torch there on the left where he's got, was it a tungsten piece? Yes. Yeah. 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 I'm definitely going to have to get something like that in the shop. Yeah. Every, every glass blower I've seen uh, or showed that to has been like, oh yeah, that's a game changer. Yeah. So I'm just adding in a little teeny glass, a bit of glass, a bleb so that, um, I can attach it to the vial without sticking the branch itself on the vial so that there's a little bit of a space. So I have it in the Nikuala now and I'm going to start attaching the bottom and then get that nice and connected and then attach the top. So it's pretty cool that the Nikuala will just hold it there for me and I can use my mini torch and a punny to kind of put that on and shape it. That's incredible. It really is. It's a yeah, cool I love tool. seeing that tool being used like that. It's great. And then right back in the Bunsen. <clears throat> Perfect. I'm jealous. And it was very seamless to use. Uh, it seemed natural uh, within a few seconds of just playing with it, it. It felt like it was an extension of your body, not yep. you, like you're having to really put a lot of thought into using it. So now I'm just adding a little bit of glass onto the bottom to make sure that it lines up using the Bunsen to make sure that the whole thing is warm while I have the next piece ready to attach, which are some little flowers. And they're just on a clear three millimeter punty and I'm heating up the end. And that way I can just attach these tiny little flowers, you know, like, like lazy glass did in the, in the branch, we have some different size flowers to demonstrate uh, different stages of growth into the kiln. That's a new kiln for the studio, guys. I'm super happy with it. It's the Scut Micro. It's really small. And since I put the studio on solar, I want to try to be as mindful as I can with my energy usage so I can use the batteries to blow glass when there's no sun. And uh, that kiln only uses 2,000 kilowatts of power compared to the Scut Mini, which I was using, which was using 4,000 kilowatts. Yeah, seeing that solar setup was amazing as well. It's cool, right? Like we get to blow glass and the sun powers our oxygen and kilns. The only thing that we're using yeah. now is propane. I think there were even some days where you, you were still generating even more than we could than we could use. Yeah. You know, so it's, it's an amazing setup. All right. So now we got glass by Jinj doing his magic and uh, yeah, I'd love to hear a little bit about what you're doing, what tools you're using you know, how, how this is all set up for you. So, um, obviously to keep in line with our cherry blossom design, I decided to go with, uh, some flower blossoms that I, I've been doing them for years now. So I'm able to kind of bust them out, uh, freehand without stenciling them. And for time's sake, it's, it's a, it's a great way. It's a great thing to have, uh, certain designs that you can just kind of fall back on without having to, uh, spend too much time um prepping which if you go watch the workshop that i did over at dozens you'll 
you'll see how I prep my pieces typically with a Sharpie beforehand. But with this particular design, I can just kind of do it uh, on the fly. And with that, um, the tool I'm using is actually, it's not a Dremel. It's actually called an engraving pen. And I just got it off of Amazon. It's only like a $40 tool. It comes with those bits, which are a three by 32 inch shank. Uh, it's a little more rare than your standard Dremel. So uh, it took me a minute to track those down. Actually, it was a friend of mine, a fellow engraver, Ganja Ganesha, if I'm saying that right. Uh, they've, they've figured out the bits because for the longest time I kept having to buy more of these tools just for that fine point bit because you can get a lot more detail with that than most uh, standard, I think it's eight, one eighth inch shank, the ones you get from Home Depot. But, um, and then other than that, I have a, just a standard aquatic fish pump hooked up to the, uh, to the engraving pin so that it's providing water to the piece as I'm carving it. That way I always have a layer of water on top and it's draining into a pan that has a hole in the bottom that leads down into the bucket that is feeding the water to the engraving pin. So it's just a a constant cycle of, of water on the piece. And I, I still wear goggles and, and a face mask just to be safe in case there's any dust. But if you do this method with the, with the hose and you have proper ventilation, you shouldn't have anything to worry about. Yeah, it was pretty cool to see, see this in detail and find all the little tricks and um, everything that you showed at the workshop that's available on the website, you guys, uh, for, my Strino level and above members to watch that replay. So if you're interested in, in learning this technique and more details about it and the tools, uh, feel free to sign up for that and watch it. And uh, I know uh, Glass by Ginge offered to to answer any questions. So that's super kind yeah. of them. Yeah, if you have any questions, let me know. And as you can see here, what I'm doing is just one flower at a time, building it <coughs> from, the, from the center outward. And then... Um, once I have a cluster, then I fill in little gaps of the leaves off to the side. And then when there's even smaller gaps, then I just go in and shade that dark. And um, so just slowly building one one flower at a time, adding a leaf here. But yeah, so just adding those leaves, it really brings together those small details and things. And a lot of times what people don't, what they always want to know is, when they get it in their hands, they're like, oh my God, the details, the details, you know? And yeah. it's just, it's more about uh, the small things. Like the same with Preston's work as well. Just having those small details in that and such a small piece, it, it always seems to impress. Yeah, it was cool to see all that work come together on, um, on a small scale like that with the vial and the tiny flowers and the tiny um, engraving. Yeah, it was, it was awesome. All right, and then you can see, guys, here's the piece, the finished vial, and it's got that Swiss micro dropper top on it that makes each drop the exact same size. And uh, yeah, you can see all that work coming together with the radicello and the carving, the tree. And with this, uh, with the carving, what I did here is, uh, I don't know if Dustin went over and flame polished it, but typically I just give it an oil finish with any natural oil. You can use hemp oil or just anything with a natural uh, high burning temp. And it gives it that nice matte black finish. And uh, Preston, what about your beautiful flowers? <laughs> um, they look beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Preston's flowers turned out great, and it was it was awesome to yeah, see. Yeah, you can work. really see the details cool. on those petals when I, you when you zoom in on that. And I especially love the placement, and um, that's the beauty of collaborations. Is I probably would have never arranged something and seen it the same way that Dustin did. And I think he did an awesome job and yeah. I would have, I would have ultimately been less happy with my own arrangement. You know, it's one of those things, but I yeah. think due to the collaboration, it just came out perfect. And, and getting down to like the, the collaboration, you know, um, what would it be called? Like the, the method behind doing it where, you know, I had a, I had a role, Preston had a role, you had a role where we all divide and conquer and just put trust into your to your fellow coworkers that they're gonna do, you know, their mm -hmm. part well, and you're gonna do your part well. And you know, at the end of the day, we knew Dustin would just slay it, knock it out of the park. So just 
being able to hand him, like Preston was saying, these pedals and get to see what he does with it is another uh, inspiration for us to kind of expand how we could be using our work in, in different ways. I also wanted to say, uh, did, did Kenzo edit this this photo that uh, we're yeah, looking Yeah, he's right here. He can hear you. Yeah, Kenzo did an awesome job photographing and, and editing this oh, yeah. piece as well as video taping everything. I mean, he was he was just as involved with uh, the the whole process as anybody. Yeah. And, oh yeah, um, yeah. A lot, we have a lot of respect for Kenzo. He doesn't uh, he does outstanding Absolutely. work. Thank you for what you do, <laughs> Kenzo. And thank you, Dustin. It was it was our pleasure, man. Yeah, yeah. Thank you to both of you, and you know, it's again it's such a great opportunity to be able to to come out and work with you and put these videos together and get some collab time in and just learn so much about, you know, glass as well as life, as well as studio management, and all these things, you know, there's just, you're a wealth of knowledge and we, uh, we love to be around you and, and pick your brain. Thanks man. Yeah, it was, it was very mutual. I enjoyed having you guys here at the Berkeley Oasis and I can't wait to have you back. Oh yeah. We can't wait for next time. Oh yeah. I'm ready. What's up guys, welcome back. I hope you enjoyed that vial. I know I sure did. It was really fun working with Lazy Glass and Glass by Ginge. It was great chemistry in the studio. So thanks you guys for checking this out and watching the creative process. You guys have asked a couple questions and I'm happy to answer them for you. The first question is from Red Bunny Inc. They'd like to know what the best wall thickness is to use for a blow tube. I like to use 12 by 2.2 or 12 by 2 around that, depending on what type of glass you're using. It's not super heavy and it's not thin, so it has a great weight for holding a piece, but it's not gonna collapse or break on you too easily. So it's kind of the middle of the road. Also, I like to use nine millimeter blow tube and 16 millimeter blow tube, depending on what the project is. The next question is from Kevin Sparks. They'd like to know how to get oxygen. They're having a hard time finding oxygen. So. Oxygen is typically sold from welding supply places like Airgas, Praxair. There's tons of different littler companies locally. I'd recommend going to a littler company. Just go to one of those welding supply places. They'll be able to sell you the gas and or rent you the tank depending on how their situation is set up. For a GTT Mirage, to answer the second part of your question, I would recommend getting at least two K-tanks so that you could fill one up while you have one plugged into the studio, so you'd never be without oxygen. Using K-tanks and bottled oxygen with high power torches can get frustrating, I guess, to be moving all the tanks all the time. So I would recommend a liquid tank if you have space, or even better, an HVO system. HVO makes an incredible oxygen system. It's self-sustaining. You just plug it in and you can continually produce enough oxygen so that you never have to get oxygen from a supplier at all. And you can even call HVO, let them know that you saw this in a video and they'll give you a small discount. HVO is awesome and I really love my system. It powers my whole studio on solar, by the way. Lazy Hound Genetics would like to know if there's any tricks to get fume to stick better. And yeah, I, the trick that I like to use, one of them is putting on a reduction flame. So I have fume on my colors and then I'll reduce it. And that seems to help the fume stick to the glass before I've worked it. And that will set me up good for what I'm gonna do when I work with the glass. All right, you guys, I know you're excited to know about the winner for the pyro video and that's Barack Schiffman. Just hit me up on the website, on the chat, say it's you and uh, I'd love to get you that. Thanks so much for watching. I appreciate all you guys is watching. Make sure that you like and comment, turn on the notifications, make sure you comment. All right, you guys, I'll see you in the next video.